came. Okay, I know this is showing off, but I am showing off much more impressive than the numbers. Alone with the baby, air, uh, air train, no, air train, Long Island Railroad, six train with the little baby and two bags. No nanny, just me and the baby. I mean, come on, pretty good. Yeah, and he's right here in the lobby because we had, we had a close connection. He'll come out and do the Q&A after. <laughs> Um, and also, we want to congratulate you because you're a producer on Jordan Peele's Us. Thank you, thank you. Like making $64 million. The opening opening. We got our record back. We lost the record for original horror opening to Quiet Place. We're going to get it back this weekend, thank God. I can rest easy. Uh, well, yeah, just to quickly give you a little background, if you've watched a horror movie in the last 10 years, there's a good chance it was produced by Blumhouse. Um, the first one, Paranormal Activity, had a 15, was it really $15,000 budget? The init when I saw it, it was 15, and when we put another $200,000 into it for the release, but the original budget was 15 grand, yeah. Uh, and grossed $193 million <laughs> and spawned five sequels. The other franchises were The Purge, Insidious, Ouija, and the last Halloween movie with Jamie Lee Curtis making a return, um, which also broke a lot of records, I believe. Um, and more recently, the high-profile Oscar-nominated Get Out, working with Jordan Peele, and Black Klansman with Spike Lee. Um, so there's a lot uh, about what Jason and his company do. Um, so maybe you could talk a little bit about, it's called a lot of things, the Blumhouse paradigm, the disruption. Um, what do you see as your place right now in the industry? Um, well, I'll talk, I guess I talk a little bit about what our model is, and I think our place in, the, in two different questions. And we have a very different model. We have 50% of our business, excuse me, is, is, is television, and 50% is movies. We're shooting right now uh, an, a seven-part miniseries for Showtime starring Russell Crowe, which is the, uh, the story of Roger Ailes, um, played by uh, an Australian Russell Crowe. So we're actually shooting that right now. Anyway, and Naomi Watts. And Naomi Australian Watts. Australian. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Um, anyway, that's happening. That's that's our TV business is is the way it r it's run is more traditional. Our movie business is kind of uh, not as kind of. Our movie business is definitely unique and and not not run in a traditional way, in that we make for our original movies like Get Out. We capped the budget at $5 million. And um, we the way that we make the movies for that amount of money is that everyone works for scale. We take no fee. And if the movies do well, everyone does well. And if they don't, no one gets hurt too badly. Um, and, and we kind of married that idea with pitching the directors that this is like the ultimate way to bet on yourself. And so the directors have an enormous amount of more control than they would have in a typical Hollywood studio movie. They have final cut. They have final say over casting. We don't have to cast movie stars because the budgets are so low. We can cast whoever the director wants. Final say over all departments. They just have total, total creative control. This, of course, actually makes the process much more collaborative because the directors aren't threatened. So the directors are actually much more inclined to ask us for our opinion and our and, and, and to seek our creative input because they don't have to take it. Um, it makes the process a lot less contentious um, and, and I think a lot more fun. And, um, and there's no distribution guarantee of any kind before we start the movie except that it will come out. So unlike a pilot, if you make a pilot and it doesn't work, it, no one ever even sees it. So our movies will definitely come out, but they may come out on streaming, they may come out in 1,500 screens, they may come out on 3,000 screens. And we've held for the last 10 years pretty true to that model of bet on yourself, don't spend a lot of money, um, and uh, you know if it works, it works really well, and if it doesn't, no one gets hurt. Like I said, I don't want to repeat myself. And the fact that we've had that model for so long has allowed a lot of different people, we can get almost anyone we want to work for us now because um, we've had a lot of success. And written a lot of checks so it's uh so it, and it's great it's a lot of fun and it, it allows us to make weird odd movies which sometimes really connect so if we could just go back a little to your background um and uh, you were a studio guy uh, originally and worked at miramax what did you learn through that process that you wanted to either not do or do when you started your own company yeah so i started I, my first i was a uh, i sold cable tv uh, a door-to-door -door salesman and then i graduated to a real estate agent i was a real estate agent in new york um, 
a uh, real estate agent by day, and at night I was uh, producing for a theater company called Malapart, and I worked at a company called Aero, and then I worked at Miramax, but I always wanted my own company. And I left Miramax in 2000 and started a version of, of the company that I have now, very different version. Um, and yes, I worked for Miramax and I learned a lot of things of, that I wanted to do and, and didn't want to do. And I think um, for, for whatever reason, as illustrated by the subway ride I took here, instead of taking a car because it's faster, um, I'm very into efficiency. And um, I'm, I, I'm known, some, some people may know or not know, in, in Los Angeles I have a van that has an office in it. And so the way I tackle traffic is I, I'm driven around by a young screenwriter and I work in the back of my <laughs> car. And I have a full, th I have internet and a printer, I have a full office back there. I do, I'm often asked, I actually also have a real office, not in a very, you know, it's not, not fancy, so I don't only work in my van, but I spend a lot of time in my van. Anyway. <laughs> I'm very into efficiency for whatever reason. And um, one of the things that drove me crazy at, at Miramax was the inefficiency, was that, that there, there's so many stories you hear of these fights that go on, especially in making movies and TV shows, like a fight over who's gonna play a certain part, or a fight over a, a, a script, a, a, a turn in the story, or a fight over the cut. And so many of those stories end with you know, it didn't matter, or I was wrong, or I lost, and by chance it worked out so much better. And so one of the things I always thought when I was at Miramax was if I had my company, I wasn't gonna waste a lot of time on those arguments. We were gonna kind of say our point of view and then let the director run with it. So I think in that way, I mean, our company operates kind of in a very opposite way of, of Miramax. You were also um, kind of under the, sort of the Harvey Weinstein never say no, um, never let anyone say no to you kind of rule him. He was famous for that. You were sent off on some impossible errands back in those days, weren't you? Didn't you have to go and try and buy, convince um, Alejandro um, and buy... Yeah, on the others. Yeah, yeah, yeah to yeah, buy yeah. the others and yeah. he'd already said no. Yeah, that was a good story. So we, um, we, uh, I was in Berlin. I did, we did, I, we went all over, I was 20, in my late 20s and I was sent all over the world to try and buy books and movies and all, you know, intellectual property of all different sorts. Poor you. <laughs> and yeah, I guess that sounds super glamorous. It wasn't glamorous at all, um, um, but I guess it sounds like it was. So, so, so I guess this, this will illustrate that. So I was at Berlin and um, I was at the festival in Berlin and, uh, and Harvey called and said, um, you know, we want to buy this script called the, called the Others. And, uh, and I, I, I'd been at, at the company about a year or two, I guess. And I, uh, the person selling, the, the rights holders were in, were in Madrid. And I called them and I said, you know what we want to do? And they said, oh, that's great. What, normal, what you normally get, which is, oh, that's great. We don't want to do a deal right now. And I had learned uh, from making a bunch of mistakes uh, what to do in that situation. So I hung up the phone and uh, I flew to Madrid. And um, I went to the guy's office and I got there, or it was Spain, so I was there at nine. He got in at like 11.30. And, uh, and, uh, and he, he walks in, he sees me there, and I said, I know you're gonna be mad, and, and yes, I'm the guy, that, little, that child that you spoke to on the phone, and here I am sitting here, but I'm going to be um, fired if I don't say, which was basically true, if I don't say that I came here and at least put you on the phone to Harvey and tell him that you're refusing to see me, but I can't go back home until I'm in your office with you. Say, and he said, "All right, well, let's let's. I'll take you to lunch." He felt bad for me, I think, and and we got the movie. <laughs> and of course, we all know Nicole Kidman got nominated for a Golden Globe, and that movie was huge success. So, uh, well, I just was involved in the buy. I was quickly shuttled aside once the production started on that one. <laughs> um, you you have particular rules that are famous. Um, in your movies, I wonder if you can outline them. There's three yeah. basic rules, and there's sort of five that I've read in that are termed in different ways. But my, it was my fascinating. Low my low budget triangle. Yes, your yes, low yeah. budget triangle. Yeah, my low budget percent. triangle. So the lot, a lot. One of the things, um, one of the fun things about making low budget movies is, like I said before, we get to try things that are different. And one of the interesting things about the company is almost every movie we done, we've done has been sitting around um, Hollywood not being made. The Purge was, you know, we've had four movies and a television series and that script was laying around for three years. Get Out was laying around. Um, and Mo uh, The Gift, uh, which was Joel Edgerton's movie, was laying around. Um, 
And I found most of the movies and definitely most of the success we've had over projects that, that other people haven't done. And the reason that we're, the reason that we oftentimes will do them is they're conceived at a higher budget. So The Purge was a 10 million. Joel wanted to make, uh, one, it was called Weirdo before we called it The Gift. He wanted to make it for eight or nine. And we'll find these scripts and we'll say to the directors, look, we'll make your movie, but you have to cut the, you know, you have to make it for five. And they say, how? And so we have, a, we have a, our, our low budget triangle. There are three sides. There's sp stunts and special effects, there's speaking parts, and there's locations. And I say to the directors, you get to pick one. <laughs> so, so what does that mean? So if you have a bunch, of, if not, you can't have a bunch, but if you have 15 or 20 speaking parts, you really get one, max two locations, no stunts or special effects. Can we do a car chase? Yes, we did a movie. Uh, we did a movie called Boy, Lex, Boy Next Door with J Lo. There was a car chase. It was directed by um, the guy who did the first uh, uh, Fast and Furious. Rob there was Cohen. Rob Cohen. Who there had to like call in a favor to get the studio. Who to got that? Because you wouldn't let him. Right? I wouldn't. Yeah. Well, that <laughs> was it. Was it? But but there was a, there was a. I allowed a small car chase. He wanted it bigger. But anyway, then we had really one location and four speaking parts. So that's the key. That's like the low budget triangle. And we put our we put the scripts through that process. And we have physical production as a big part of. Uh, the company, and so we'll read the scripts and we'll tell the director, like, look, if you want to do the movie with us, this is what it would look like, and it generally adheres to that rule. Those, the triangles over here, the biggest way we keep the movies low budget, I already mentioned, which is that all the above line uh, works for scale and there's no producing fee. So let's go a little bit more into the detail of those three things um, and some examples. Um, location, you've, you've taken scripts that have a whole lot of locations and figured out a way to have them, or did you go looking for a script that only had one location? Like Get Out is pretty much one location. The gift is a lot in just one house. So is that when, you look, when you're looking at scripts, are you sort of clocking those things? When we look for scripts, it's a, it's a, it's a cool, it's an interesting process. And again, it ties into the, the low budget, um, kind of the, the low budget model that we have. What, we, what I describe for when we're looking for scripts is low budget, high concept. So the triangle rule applies, but somehow there's gotta be a high concept because we're making movies for the mall. We're not making movies for Sundance. So in order to go to the mall, you have to have a high concept idea somewhere in your, in your story. But one of the super cool things about doing um, low budget movies is that the way that we choose creatively our movies is the opposite of the way studios choose movies. And what I mean when I say that is when you're running a studio and you're making a choice about whether or not to make a $100 million movie, the only responsible way to do that, and I would do the exact same thing if I was doing a $100 million movie, is you have to, you go into a meeting, there are five people, one from marketing, one from distribution, one from international, and you, if you're presenting your case to get a green light for your movie, you have to say, it feels like these three other movies in the past five years that have been successful. You have to have comps, right? And then people say to Hollywood, why are all the movies feel the same? <laughs> well, that's why, you know, because they, they get made because they literally, they look at the successful movies and then they repeat it. Now, we are not geniuses with picking movies, but we are, we have the opposite process because we're not taking risk like that. So our filter that we choose movies from, it's the opposite. It's first you have to love it. It has to be low budget, high concept, right? Or we have to be able to think we can get it to a low budget. It has to be high concept. But then the, the metric is it has to feel like nothing you've ever seen before, right? Like when we read Get Out, it's like everyone read it and we all loved it and we felt like this is the weirdest movie of all time. <laughs> and and we were, we were, uh, we there was a lot of you know we were encouraged not to make that movie by a lot of different people because it felt so weird, um, but but the reason that I'm um, such a, a nut about low budget is it is is because of that is because it allows us to choose movies in the totally opposite way that that Hollywood chooses movies and um, and and that process has been obviously very effective for us and continues to be effective because. You know, one of the thing people uh, not to uh, not to put words in your mouth, people will say, "Well, why doesn't everyone do it?" And the reason that um, the reason for that is that it's um, you know it is is people's ego, and their low budget movies are not sexy. 
And so we're, it, we're playing in this part of the business. And it's also not sexy to do it. It's much sexier to say, I bought the hottest script and it was a big auction and we paid the most. And it's going to be the greatest movie. More often than not, that script doesn't get made. Um, but, uh, but, but we're kind of doing something very different, which is um, which the answer to the, not that you asked it, but the answer to, the, to why do other people don't do it is you have to have discipline and you have to kind of not be a, tr everything Hollywood is built for everyone to push to make more expensive movies. And so we, we push the other way. And you know, you ended up with movies that were in the Oscar race two years in a row. So that must feel pretty satisfying knowing you did it your way and you still got the sexy side of it a little bit, right? Yeah, yeah no, the result definitely. Um, but uh, but we, we, I don't, we're, it's not gonna change our, our, uh, our model, you know, our model is really we're looking, and if, if we get recognized by the Academy, that's awesome. And I don't want, I, I, I hate people, like, I don't care, like, I totally care. I definitely want to win an Oscar. Um, <laughs> um, 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 and, uh, but, uh, but, but we don't run the business to fulfill that personal desire of mine. Right. <laughs> now, I, until, I, until I looked into this whole uh, formula that you had, I didn't realize how speaking parts made a difference in budget. Yes, they Could do. you explain they a little bit about that? Because in Australia, I don't think it's no. it's that, that it's much from of it. SAG. It's from SAG. So, yeah, so the, the guild, the, it's, ju it's just the Screen Actors Guild. We're all, our, all our movies are union, which is very important, and we're, we're, um, uh, we're very careful about that. Um, but it, it's just because SAG. So if, you, if your waiter right. comes up and doesn't say anything... It's an extra. It's $125. If they say that you want a sandwich, it's $1,000. <laughs> so you'll notice a lot of our waiters, they'd nod in our movies. <laughs> <laughs> you must have some interesting conversations about those uh, decisions. Well, with the direct, the great thing is, you know, we're very transparent with the directors. It's not, we're not, like, like there's no, and we give the directors our bud, the budget, and, you know, it's like, yeah, you can have the director going to ask for a sandwich, or you can have, like, a thousand dollars for something else, and more often than not, the director, you know, agrees with us. Um, <laughs> um, so it, it works. And what about the actors? I mean, I heard you got uh, J-Lo for, like, a ridiculously tiny amount for that movie, that Rob Cohen directed. How do you get these A-list stars to come on board when there's no money in it up front? Well, in the beginning it was hard. And one of the things I was always frustrated by as How much did you pay her, by the way? Oh, in the, like, up front, $9,000, ten to $12,000, I think, $12,000. Um, she, 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 we don't have trailer. We have, you know, little tiny crappy trailers. She wanted her own trailer. She paid for it herself, which I, everyone knew. <laughs> she, we had this tiny movie. She was doing this tiny movie, and the crew was tiny, and the footprint of the movie was very small. She had a huge trailer, and she had two Rolls Royces that would take her from the trailer to the set, which was awesome, I thought. <laughs> Clear, clearly not paid for by us. Um, um, you could have traded that in and made another indie on her own. We could have made the sequel for the price of the Rolls Royces. Um, we, uh, we, I was always very frustrated that, that lawyers and agents and, and representatives would make a lot of money negotiating profit points and net points in a movie. And, and Hollywood is famous for you know Hollywood accounting and their movies are never profitable. And the net point definition is 50 pages long and it's garbage. So here is one, of, back to your first, you know, one of the things, and that always happened when we were at the studio, was like they were, the, they were, the negotiation would take six weeks because they were trying to define what the profit of the movie was. And very early on, I had this, I, it actually wasn't my idea, but I just, I, it, it's, it, w it had been done before, but it, no one had done it exclusively. And we just, I just said, look, if we make a movie, and you, it used to be read on a paper, not on your phone, and you read when it started doing this, when you read in Variety that the movie makes $30 million, you get $100,000. And 40 million, you get another 150, or whatever it is. And I could go into that, the, how we determine what it is if, if anyone's interested. But, um, but, so we've always done that. So when the movies hit a certain box office, I actually film myself. I have I take a hundred thousand dollar shower with Jamie Lee Curtis. It was many more hundreds of thousand dollars, but I made it. I make a video of me putting a check in a FedEx, and I go to the FedEx and I send the and I say Jamie. And there's nothing better than sending checks to actors because it means and 
directors, any uh, per people who participate, because it means the movie's profitable and it means everyone's doing well. So it's like complaining about paying income tax. Like that's a good thing. If you're paying a lot of income tax, things are going well. So, so and that's, is that how you got Jamie Lee on board? To that's how everyone this? does. That's how everyone does it. So, so if we hit a certain level of box office, you get a che you get checks personally by me. And um, and we've done that a lot now, so we're known for that. And we're there's no you, it's impossible to cheat, so it makes the negotiation super fast. And um, people are very open. We ne Jamie Lee Curtis never would have done Halloween for scale for us had we not had the history that we had prior to doing that movie. Um, being called a disruptor, there's a lot of disruptors around right now. I wonder what you think of this the the environment we're in, um, what's your take on the future of filmmaking and where it fits in with, you know, we've got all these platforms coming up, there's all the arguments with the Academy about what makes a movie versus, you know, whatever. Um, where, where do you see your films fitting in and also where do you see the future for everybody who's here, who's young and who's starting out, who wants to know what they should be worried about? Um, well, well, for those of you who are young and starting out on the on the on my on our, my side of the business, which is the selling side, the filmmaking producing side, uh, in my opinion, the the near to mid future uh, for you guys is extraordinarily rosy, and it is rosy because there is we're still at the beginning of what is going to be a wild. Um, competitive landscape between every streamer that and the streamers aren't even set up yet Apple is like just announcing and they're very at the very beginning stages Warner hasn't even launched uh, Disney hasn't even launched Comcast hasn't even launched and there's going to be this wild competition and, and the studios are going crazy that Silicon Valley that Amazon and Netflix are so far ahead of them and and I think you know if it's if for the next three to five years, it's it's going to be a bonanza for producers because it's just going to be so hyper crazily competitive for movies and for TV. Um, right. And it's it's going on right now. I always make this joke. We we, we did uh, we did sharp objects for HBO. And uh, I hope no one from HBO is here. I hope they don't mind me saying this, but it's true, which is if you actually um, divided like the amount of people that saw sharp objects in the budget, like one view of sharp objects would be like a thousand dollars, like it just makes no sense. The budget of the the budget of the show versus how many how many the budget of so many shows versus the people that are seeing the shows. So long term, someday the the you know there's going to be a reckoning. Like it's got to calm down. But right now, and certainly, you know, like I said, for the next upcoming years, it's 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 going this way. It's not coming down. But eventually, it'll will all come back to earth. What do you think about the idea of what constitutes a movie, whether it's it's on you know, on Netflix or Amazon or in a theater? Yeah, well, I think I think about Did the you question. Make them both? Well, I would I would even ask or anyone here if anyone has an idea. I I don't have like a really strong position about like it should be what the defining a theatrical versus non-theatrical but what no one has given a good answer to is if um, the streamers get their way how do you define the, the only thing that makes sense about holding on to that theatrical window is currently the only way you can define a movie that's eligible for an Oscar is it's been in a theater for X amount of time so if the theater goes away or if it's on theater and TV, if the theater goes away or if it's on theater and the TV in the same time or whatever, then how, d how do you tell the difference between an Oscar and an Emmy? Not that that really matters, <laughs> um, which I don't really think it matters, but, but, um, but, uh, but no one's really answered that. And I think, um, I think it's, uh, I think the theatrical versus, you know, mo theatrical movies and streaming movies, the line is getting blurrier and blurrier and blurrier. And I think we can all talk about it as much as we want, but in it's going to converge, and the windows are going to shrink eventually, and um, and and it's a matter of time before that happens. Right. Um, and what about short form content? That seems to be the newest sort of explosion. And I know you're working on a project with Naomi Watts um, for Katzenberg's uh, and Whitman's new company. Quibi, Quibi, it's Quibi. Called. Is yeah. that how you say That's it? Uh, yeah, I think Quibi. so. Quibi. 
Um, I think short form content is uh, we actually we actually um, are we had own a piece of a company called Crypt too, which does low budget uh, scary stuff online. Um, and I think short form com- content has traditionally been you know low cost and kind of a, an entryway for filmmakers, producers, actors, writers, directors to kind of graduate to film and TV. And maybe that's changing. Maybe it's not. Jeffrey Katzenberg certainly thinks it is. I'm interested to try it. To, mm to see what he's doing, what Quibi is, is it, it, for those of you who don't know, is very expensive. Um, sh- it's actually not, they're actually not shorts, they're chapters. They're short form series, they're right? li- it's like It's like a it's like a movie in 10 parts. Yeah, so you, the idea is so many people are co- consuming content on their phone and, there's you, and you watch on your phone for 10 minutes, so these would be chapters, um, and that's what we're doing with him. Um, but uh, but it's a big experiment. It hasn't been done yet, so I'm curious to see what happens. And so that you're working with Naomi on, on that one as well. You have a long history with a lot of Aussies. Do you want to talk about that? Is that a coincidence or do you No, find because a there's something in – I was thinking about this. I was coming here. There's something in the water in Australia that makes Australians more talented than the rest of us. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't get it. So Good it's thing tr- to it's say, true. Jason, right but here. Lo- but yeah, I was thinking it's true even more than um, – than here's my list of, of Aussies that we're working with. Lee Wanell, James Wan, Joel Edgood, and Russell Crowe, Naomi Watts, Sienna Miller, Rada Mitchell – Angus Sampson, Peter Peter Cornwall, uh, and Greg McLean, to name a few, and it is strange the ratio of um, super talented people in movie and TV to population in Australia. It, it's better than anywhere else. So I don't know what goes on in Australia. It's 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 incredible. But well, uh, you but gave uh, Joel Edgerton the the chance that he needed to make the gift, yeah. and that really set him off on a directing. In a, yeah, career, in yeah. another yeah. on another journey. What what was that experience like when you get a, a first-time director and somebody that you can really sort of help launch them? It was fun. We don't – our system doesn't really work um, with with first-time directors, interestingly enough. It's kind of counterintuitive. A lower budget is much more effective with a director who's had a lot of experience. With a, a first-time director, really, it does, the system doesn't work this way, but a first-time director should get more money because they don't know what they're doing. So they don't know about what's going to wind up in the – movie or the TV show and what isn't. A, an experienced director really knows, so they actually need less. Um, uh, we have clearly worked with first-time directors. With Joel and Jordan Peele were first-time directors, but they had been on, you know, Joel, uh, Jordan um, was a showrunner and, and Joel, they'd spent an enormous amount of time on sets, so they weren't really the what, you, what comes to mind when you hear first-time director, which is the 22-year-old just starting out. Um, Joel and I had a great time together. He definitely, in the beginning, was a little when when the, I, I was thinking of the title. He was very definitely a little wary when I'm like, we're we're not. Call-. I said in like the second month, I said the movie we're not calling a weirdo, Joel, and he he, w- he was kind of shocked. I w- I'm an abrasive American, and um and um and he uh he was incredibly fun to work with, and we're talking about doing. There's a, there's there's. There's other things that we're working on currently together, so obviously we had a, we had a really fun, great time, and I think um, I think um, you know he was kind of set on making the independent version of of the gift, and and I I before we started, you know, said, look, I want if I'm going to do this, I want to do the studio version of the movie, and. Um, and so we went down that road together, and it turned out to be to be great and fun. But I think it was in the initially it was he thought I think he thought we were nuts. But then he really came around to our process. I also think, uh, knowing the Australian film industry so well, that the, the other parallel is that um, in Australia you you're sort of forced to find those rules that you mentioned yourself because there's never enough money in Australia to make the movie you want to make um, and so it's fo- it forces crews and people involved to get really creative about you know not having the visual effects budget or not you know not being able to afford all those extras and how do you you do that so I think maybe that's also something with the Australians where I don't know whether working with Lee and James who you've worked with a lot whether you find that they are kind of good at thinking on their feet about ways to kind of well, they're they're I mean, so you're they're they they they're w- we've done seven movies with Lee. He's 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 one of the one of if not our most important filmmaker at the company. Um, James would be too, but he just is way onto bigger and better. But he still you know produces movies with us occasionally. Um, 
Um, but uh, but the 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 when we shot Lee's movie Upgrade in Australia uh, last year um, and had an um, had a terrific experience. We're going back with him. I was just going to say, and you had. Sort of not an announcement, but you're allowed to say you're going back to Australia. We're going to go back to it. Uh, hope, hopefully, 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 if we get all if we do, do all do all, do all of our paperwork right, um, we're going to go <laughs> back to Australia um, this summer to shoot another movie with Lee. And uh, well, I'll have to introduce you to Graham Mason up there from Screen Australia. We, we've never met. <laughs> Who's that? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, and uh, and um, uh, the the the. the the I guess there's two kinds. I mean, Graham, you guys could speak better this than me. But that when when a big Hollywood show comes into Australia, that's one thing. But the local production in Australia is done in a much more responsible way. So the the production value we got on Upgrade, regardless of the fact that we got the rebate and all that, which was terrific, obviously. But even if we had spent the exact same gross number in Los Angeles, we would have had half the movie that we had in Australia, which is why we're going back. Wow. Um, Okay, we have some time for questions. Question, my favorite part, ask hard ones. Let's say that you have a script, or a bunch of them, as a writer or producer, you know, and it's a bit frustrating, because I think sometimes people hold on to their scripts and they hope that when Johnny Depp read it, they're gonna get their 30 million, it's gonna get done, you know. Don't do that. And th yeah, I know. Don't wait for Johnny Depp. It's, you want to like... I mean, if that's one guy, You want to slash your wrists when you hear that, right? Right? It's like, oh my God. Yeah, I hate but that the, too. But then when you have, you know, like a script that you already know is super, like, ultra low or low budget, it's been written very intelligently as far as that goes, you know, with like one major location in mind, let's say, how on the lake or something it feels like there is a gap a little bit at least after film school or y you know just generally how do you get it to write people like yourself like how, what's the process besides agents or do you always have to like find the right agent fi find the person you know the question. middleman for the middleman the middleman who you know I think if you're if that's where you are in your career you don't actually want me to read it like I'm the wrong person to read it and what what I would I, what I would say um, is that you, and I made this mistake. The first movie I ever did was a movie called Kicking and Screaming. Noah Baumbach directed it. Uh, um, who was your roommate in college? Who was college, my roommate in college? Yeah, he was my roommate uh, <laughs> when I was when I was a um, uh, cable sa when I was selling cable TV in Chicago. He was my roommate there too, and we 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 had this script, and we I really remember. And this even it's though it's been. 30 years, it hasn't changed in this way. We could, there was, she's gotta have it, it just come out. There was like, we were told by the line producer, like there's a $100,000 version of this, there's an $800,000 version, and there's a million four version. And we, what we should have done, and what, to answer your question, is, you know, whether you like it or not, and some people don't like to think about it, there's a market for movies. And if you keep pushing down, if your script is decent, and you keep pushing down on that budget, eventually you're gonna get to a place where someone's gonna say, hey, for that amount of money, I'll give this a shot. And so what I wouldn't do is write, I just would never write and wait for like someone established or an actor or whatever to read it. What I would do if it's a story that could be told inex inexpensively is well, however cheap you think, like make it for half that, and then you know you can you could there there's 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 money out there in a, in a way that there hasn't been before to do low super low budget movies because of streaming there's a, there's a market then yeah, there's a big market it's a little it's a crazy thing but there are movies being bought for 200 and 250 grand 300 grand and um, it's vibrant you don't hear about it you don't read about it but it's out there and um, and that would be my advice is really not to wait for the establishment push your budget down and and try and do it that way does that make sense it does, thank you. And I've heard about Quibi before and you know all of the things that are happening now and, and coming up and obviously media convergence and all that prior. It seems like so much is happening that it's actually quite difficult to get this information about where to go even once the movie is made. Like AFM and all the big ones, that seems like huge. When your movie's cost. made, at festival. Mm -hmm. Always, and there's great weather. There's a, every day of the year there's a festival going on somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's what to do with your movie when it's done. Okay. okay. How do you pay for your own expenses when you get into producing? Well, I just told you how I did. And what I always, I was always drawn to, and I still am, I hated the idea of working by the hour. Again, my crazy efficiency, right? <laughs> because I, I, I always th I w thought, I thought clearly I thought a lot of myself, and I thought I'm worth more than that. I'd rather get paid for what exactly I can accomplish. 
And that started with selling cable. You only got paid when you sold a cable subscription. And it graduated to um, renting apartments. You only got paid if you actually closed a deal to rent the apartment. And I'm still, I'm 50 years old, I'm doing the same thing. I only get paid if my movie makes money. I don't get a fee on my movie, right? I only get paid if it works. Um, um, n and not everyone, and there's no reason to do commission only jobs. I mean, there, there's zero reason to do that. But I think it is, um, What's great about commission only is you could make your own hours, but I think you have to give yourself, cut yourself some slack and say, I'm not gonna make money doing what I love right out of the gate if I wanna do it on my own, right? There, there's, the, there's two ways to do it. You can go be a, an assistant at an, in the system, right? There's that, nothing wrong with that. Or if you say like, look, I, I wanna try this on my own, there's nothing, you know, don't be good, get a job waiting tables, you know what I mean? Just do, do another, don't, what you don't want to do, because you'll make bad decisions, is say like, I have $10,000, I'm going to go four months, and just, if it doesn't work in four months, I'm going to do so, you know what I mean? Like, that, you, you make bad, you'll make bad decisions about producing, because as soon as you put a time limit on a, something getting made, it'll never get made in that time, never. Um, so, 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 so give yourself a break. Do, do there are other jobs, drive an Uber, do whatever you can to make some, doing something else. And then you'll produce and you'll make the right decisions about it. We don't have a low, but it's, it's a funny thing. Yeah, we did. I wanted to take the same formula to, um, to TV. And if you Google Jason Blum, low budget TV, Wall Street Journal, there's a huge article that came out like four or five years ago, like Blumhouse getting into low budget television. Total failure. <laughs> Just didn't work at all. And it didn't work because the movie business is, is ailing. It's definitely ailing, which means it's super price conscious, right? The studios, if you say your horror movies cost $30 million, I can make the same thing for five, they listen. The television business is booming, like I talked about before. They don't care about that. They, they'll say they will, but they don't care about the budgets of the shows. They want a loud and noisy show, no matter what it costs. And so the idea, I would say, like, we're going to make great quality TV. I was going to, I had 10 episodes for a million, really cheap. And then I'm like, okay, let's do 10 episodes for 10 million, a million a piece. No, just no interest. Just no, not, 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 there, there was cursory interest, but when you really dug down into it, the model doesn't work unless if it, if it, if a lot of people watch that show, you got to get a big check. If a lot of people go see my movie, I get a big check, right? And the reason that it you could tell the interest wasn't real is I would describe what would be a total hit. Right for for and the the network is okay. We'll pay you another three four hundred thousand dollars for that. And I'd be like, that's not it. Like you you pay fifty million dollars in development for shows for scripts for and to get a show on the air for two years in a row is almost impossible. So if I put a show on the air and you renew it for season two, you got to give us a big bonus. Anyway, whatever it did it never worked, and and I learned my lesson. And so I I I I, I pulled up my sticks and went home. And now our TV business. We use the brand of Blumhouse, um, so it's it's we I like to say we like to say things that scare you at night. Roger Ailes, no one's scarier to me than Roger <laughs> Ailes. Um, um, but we don't use the financial model. Do you have a tax bill? No, no, we spent no because it's not it's some of it. Sometimes it's our money. Sometimes it's sharp objects. I mean, it was it was it was like I said, it would cap was uh, you know anything. We, I mean, try, I won't go into it. But anyway, I will say the director the director. Um, we, we, we look, we, 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 we're building a house, the amount of money it costs to build a house. I look, I'm nervous talking about it. I was like, I can, we can't do this. They said, sure, go build the house. So we did. He, wor he worked very relaxed schedule. That's what we did. <laughs> uh, depends on the production company. We prefer, I much prefer a good production company than no production company. And oftentimes when there isn't a production company, we hire somebody. So we just, we're doing a movie called The Hunt right now that Craig Zobel is, uh, is directing um, in, in Louisiana. And we hired uh, Julie Goldstein, a producer, to come on it. So, so we often hire outside producers. It's better for us to have an outside producer. And if we don't have one, we hire them. But they're, it's hard to come by. Very, very hard for a producer to think for some reason, like, but w I, I get we don't get a fee, but how much is my fee?
when they're working, less so New York indie film, right? But when they're working for studios, the director's time is, is there's an inverse relationship between the time the director thinks about the actual making of his movie or her movie and the politics of the movie based on the budget. So what I mean is for a $25 million studio movie, the director's spending, let's say, 75% of, of his or her time on the creative and 25% on the politics. For a $100 million or $200 million movie, the director's spending about 20% of it, their time directing the movie and 80% of their time managing a big public company's $200 million with a lot of stressed out people. So um, when uh, what I was talking about, which is a different way to say it, when it's, when it's $5 million and when they have creative control, because all on those movies, they, they're, they're, they don't have final cut. So when the director wants something that the studio doesn't want, they have to spend a long time and a lot of energy trying to figure out how they're going to manipulate the studio into getting that. And um, and I guess I'm thinking of talking to Baz Luhrmann. There are a few directors that don't have that problem, right? There are 10 geniuses like Baz Luhrmann who don't have that problem. But for the rest of us, right, the studio has control, right? So, so you can't have Baz so make a movie for you. So well, no, he can do – what what Baz can do is make a movie for – like he would have all the control of Blumhouse for a hundred million dollars. There are a few directors like that, but they're few and far between. Um, um, but 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 just to answer your question, so so when a director is working for us, they aren't thinking about how they're going to win. They've already won because if they feel if they if what they want to do, we are going to do. That doesn't mean hey, we think this would be a better way to do it. We think this, you should do this, you should do that, you should do that. And what I was kind of saying before, maybe not clearly, is because they don't have to stress out all the time about getting their way, they know they're going to get their way, they're much more likely to ask for our creative input. As soon as you give them final cut and say everything's up to you, I, the phone doesn't stop ringing. What should I do about this? What should I do about this? <laughs> Who should I cast for this? Who should I cast for this? Where I would like, shut up already. Make your movie. Uh, I had a quick question before I go back to you about advice. Um, you said don't keep your eye on what gets you the most money. Keep your eye on what gets your movie made was one thing that you were quoted as saying. Never, never. never? No, keep, don't keep your eye on what makes you the most. What gets you the most money. Keep your eye on what gets your movie made. Gets you the most money for the budget of the movie, you Probably mean? Probably what, how much, like what you think you're going to, yeah. What you think you're going to raise well, for the. I'm quoting you, so. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I can't even make sense okay, of my so own quote. <laughs> uh, I don't know what that means. I, I was, I I was, I was drunk. I don't know what that means. At <laughs> when I, th but I, I, I could, I could, I could. Um, I guess it's I the Johnny know. Depp thing. It's like don't think about like if I wait and get the right actor or, or this happens, you know, then I'll do it. But you just want to do what gets your movie made. I'll give a different piece of advice, which I think would be more helpful for this Thank room, you. based on this. <laughs> that what was I, my next what question. I, what, what I, else? What, what, I, what, I, the, uh, what I say, which maybe uh, that was a, a messed up way of saying it, is th I think when you're starting out, there's too much emphasis on people like me saying, like, you know, you, you need to find something that you love, and then you don't take no for an answer, and then you just – do whatever you can and just make it happen. And I, I, I you know, that's a nice story. I think that's, I, I think that's, I, I think that's largely garbage when you're starting out. It's true for me, which I feel so lucky. My job is so fun now. Like, what's the goal of my company? To be independent, to get to do whatever we want to do. And I don't get to do whatever I want to do, but we're super close. I can look at something and really, you know, unless it's, Cuckoo bananas, you know, really get pretty close to getting it made. Amazing. It took 30 years. When I started out picking scripts, I didn't pick scripts of like what I was in love with or what, you know, what's going to change the world. I picked scripts of like, okay, I can get this. I can, I, I, this is a genre movie or whatever. I can raise money for this. I can get it made. And, and the best advice I was given when I started out is movies beget movies. And if you look at my first eight movies, they're terrible. They're terrible. We made one good one and seven horrible movies. But we were making movies. And when I, w I, I was me alone then, I was making movies. So when I called an eight, even though the movies, never, no one ever saw. They went to a film festival to answer your question and went straight to the video bin. But, 
but but I was in production, you know, I was doing stuff. So and and the way and the reason the movies weren't very good is I was choosing what the market would bear. Like I was I was choosing what and and, and I think that maybe is what I was was referring to. And I think that's important to when you're starting out is to pick things that 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 there's a market for because and even if you don't love them, you're working to the place to get to doing stuff you love. But when you start out, you can't just do stuff you love. Uh, last quick question. Who was the person? You had your head. Well, Jordan was in a different place in his career. So the question is, what happened at the end of Get Out? The first Get Out, at what there was a... The first Get Out, what happened at the end? We cha we sh reshot the end of Get Out, what happened, right? So we... we, we we um, uh, screened Get Out, and the original Get Out, Daniel um, is in jail. Um, so the cop car comes up, and what you think is going to happen happens. It's not airport security. It's a real cop. And they arrest Daniel, and they put him in jail. And it's, it's like you, you wanted to commit suicide at the end of the movie because you fall in love with Daniel. By the way, Daniel, God bless him, loved this ending. The one who he was so mad at me the most was Daniel for this. Thankfully, it wasn't his decision. It was up to Jordan, as I've said before. So we tested the movie, and the movie is playing great and testing great, and then it has this downer ending, and everyone, everyone, you feel cheated because you fall in love with Daniel in that movie. The magical thing about that movie is you're first looking at it, whether you're white or you're black, and you're kind of like, oh, I'm feeling uncomfortable, and then everyone gets behind. You can't not. And then you, the movie just, you can't, you gotta let him win. And, uh, and I said, in that case, it was, it was well, I forget what the question, but in that case, it was my, the movie ended, it was a test screening a little bigger than this, and I just, I blurted out as I tend to do, I'm like, Jordan, you cannot go to jail! <laughs> and, uh, and Jordan looked shocked, and I was totally not like, polite or politic about it, but again, because it's up to him, I can say whatever I want, you know, it's the director's not scared. And, uh, and anyway, Jordan thought, I pitched some horrible idea, and Jordan thought of a much better idea, which was the, the air security and the, and the end of the movie as it is, and we reshot it, and Jordan liked it much better, and it worked. But that's a good illustration of the, how the process works. Do you think he would have been willing to change it if he thought that you were trying to force him? Like, if the, if the dynamic had been different, you think he would have dug his heels in more? I think, it, yeah, it would have been much, it's just like I said, it would have been much more contentious. It would have been much more, it, you feel free too. If I also, also no one feels, unless you're a sociopath, you don't feel good to if forcing someone either. So if, if I have all the power in that situation, I wouldn't have blurted that out, right? But, I, but since Jordan has the power, I'm fr I feel very free to speak my mind. Well, we're so grateful that you came and spoke your mind and got the subway and a plane right. and everything. And I hope a lot of people in this room one day get to work with you. Well, thank you. Thank you. I love thank Australia you, and I love Australians, so I'm happy to be here. <laughs>